brief, where on the first Tuesday of every month, we have experts who are going to look into the situation of Northeast Asia and particularly the relationship between North Korea, South Korea, the United States, and the six parties that have been involved there. Today's panel is led by Ambassador Christopher Hill. We also have uh, Dr. Alexander Manzaroff and also Ambassador Kathleen Stevens. Ambassador Joseph Detrani is a regular panelist, panelist also, but he is traveling today. Ambassador Hill is the Charles W. Ball Distinguished Adjunct Professor of International Affairs in the Columbia University School of International Public Affairs. And he also has a, a distinguished career as four-time ambassador appointed by three presidents, the U.S. Ambassador to Macedonia, Poland, Korean and, Korea, and Iraq. And prior to that posting, he was also Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian, Asian and Pacific Affairs for five years, which he headed during that time, he headed the U.S. delegation to the six party talks. Also, Professor Alexander Manzaroff is an adjunct professor of security studies at the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University in Washington. He is one of the few people in the world who holds advanced degrees from Moscow State University of Inter International Relations, Columbia University in New York, and Kim Il-sung University in Pyongyang. Ambassador Kathleen Stevens is our special guest today. We're honored to, that she would join us and she is the president and CEO of the Korea Economic Institute of America in Washington. She also has a distinguished career as a diplomat in the U.S. Foreign Service, including the U.S. Ambassador as the U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Korea. She was the first woman and first Korean speaker to serve in that position. Other overseas postings were in China and former Yugoslavia, Portugal, Northern Ireland, and she was U.S. Consul General in Belfast during negotiations culminating in the 1998 Good Friday Agreement and in India, where she was the U.S. Charge d'Affaires. I'd like to present uh, Ambassador Hill, our moderator today. Chris, welcome. Thank you very much, Michael, and let me welcome everybody to this, uh, this edition uh, of Washington Insight. I think... Um, we have talked a lot about North Korea and what our attitudes are, but I thought today uh, is a great opportunity to have a focus on how the ROK is looking at its neighbor in the North, uh, its kin in the North, and what we can kind of expect over the short, medium, even long term in the ROK about, the ad, about their attitudes to North, to North Korea, especially as we go through, I think it's fair to say, a pretty difficult uh, negotiating period. Uh, we have, uh, there's no one better to, uh, to talk about this than Ambassador uh, Stevens. Uh, Dr. Jenkins, you, you've gone through Ambassador Stevens' uh, really fabulous career, except leaving out one thing. She was also a Peace Corps volunteer uh, in Korea before she started as a diplomat. I would argue that when you're in the Peace Corps, you've already started as a diplomat. And I think that really showed as well with, uh, with Kathy Stevens. So Kathy, uh, I could talk all day about uh, our mutual Peace Corps experiences, but I'd really like to hear uh, how you are kind of looking at uh, uh, what are, are the feelings in, in South Korea and where are we likely to go? And I thought maybe we could have more of a kind of conversation about this because uh, 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 Sasha um, Man, uh, Mansurov is also very well positioned to talk about some of these uh, some of these issues. So, Kathy, let me start with you and uh, and if you can offer any kind of introductory comments to uh, get us going. Oh, well, Chris, thank you very much, and uh, I too very much look forward to having a conversation. I can't think of it. Thank you to Michael for his kind introduction, and thank you to the Washington Brief for. Uh, for doing this. Um, I, I did watch a, a bit of some of the earlier episodes and I know every week you've done a very deep dive and I hope we could do a bit of a deep dive or maybe a different part of the pool here or whatever the metaphor is into, uh, you know, where do we go with the unfinished business on the Korean Peninsula as I call it. But as you've already said, I think that one thing and it's something Chris, I, I, I remember hearing from you as well when you were working, you and I were both working uh, uh, on Korean affairs and the uh, 2005, 2006 period, and that is 
from the United States perspective, the most important relationship we have is actually with South Korea, not North Korea, which is not to say we don't have really important business with, South, with North Korea. But, um, but I, I think, and this is something I think well known, and, and I see it in the, uh, in the link to the Washington brief and what you're doing, that you can't really think about the diplomatic challenges of North Korea, and particularly the issue of denuclearization, the security threat, uh, that poses the nuclear weapons, the missiles, the cyber, all of it, uh, the regime itself to the region and to the world uh, without thinking about kind of how we got there uh, and about uh, the Korean peninsula and its own, you know, both tragic and triumphant history of the last 50 or 60 years. And I'm not going to, we're gonna have a conversation. I'm not gonna talk about all that history, but I do think it's important to remember that you know, South Korea actually matters in this equation. It matters vis-a-vis -vis our alliance, our values, all of that, the United States and South Korea. But it also matters if we're going to try to break this Gordian knot of uh, addressing the, uh, the stubborn issues that you have been talking about for the past uh, few weeks on this program and months and uh, all of these years in our various capacities of, uh, of addressing uh, the stubborn, uh, the stubborn problems, if you like, and tragedy of, of the DPRK in North Korea. So anyway, I'm happy. This is I'm happy to join both you, Ambassador Hill, who I consider to be not only I consider, but I I think considered among all who have been in diplomacy to be a leading negotiator of of our generation or any generation of American diplomats. And of course, my good friend, uh, Sasha Mansaroff, who I think is one of the great Korea experts. And that again, reinforces my point that I think we have to think both about, if you like the diplomatic negotiation process of, of how do we get into a real denuclear negotiation and not just a negotiation, but progress, but also and this I take from my Northern Ireland experience, how do we advance a peace process or whatever we wanna call it? And a peace process means dealing with the unresolved relationship between this divided country divided uh, uh, by no fault of its own in 1945, and then a division, of course, uh, uh, solidified by a tragic war that destroyed both parts, all of that. We need to address that. The relationships that North Korea has not only with the South, the South-North, but also with the United States, Japan, China, and so on and so forth. So I, I said a conversation, and now that's kind of the scene setter there is, I think sometimes we go so much to the, the fierce urgency of, how are we going to, you know, how are we going to get to the negotiations table and what are we going to do about nuclearization? We do need to have that broader context in mind. And how South Korea approaches this, of course, is very important. And South Korea is a democracy. They're having a presidential election in March. And that makes it, and South Koreans have for many, many uh, years not been reluctant about expressing their views on important uh, uh, issues of state and doesn't get much more important than your own the, your own national future and national identity. Uh, so I did think, and uh, Ambassador Hill suggested that we might talk a little bit about about how South Koreans view this whole process. And uh, I'm I'm taking this mostly from kind of anecdotal way. You know, you hear a lot of things out there, and some of them happen to be true. I think maybe uh, that. Uh, uh, you know, 70 years after the division of Korea, uh, with South Korea having transformed itself into really what it represents to be a successful Korean in the 21st century, right? Uh, a modern economy, uh, uh, a, a thriving democracy, uh, which doesn't mean it's not obstreperous, but certainly a thriving democracy. And of course, whether one calls it soft power or just a lot of great movies and films and food and everything else, uh, really punching above its weight in a soft way. <laughs> Um, uh, as well as uh, being uh, said, a, a real power to reckon with uh, in the world and regionally. So, so with all that, you know, where do they, how do they look at the North and what do they think about it? And it's been a stereotype to say, well, that younger generation, they kind of want, don't want to pay much attention to the North. You know, they're thinking about other things. And of course, the Korean government, successive Korean governments from both the so-called progressive and conservative wings have always wanted, I think, to do a couple of things. One is to strengthen Korea's place in the world, strengthen its relation with the United States, of course, strengthen this economy and get into a complicated relations with China, as we all do, but also have a breakthrough with North Korea. They have different ways of approaching it, uh, but they've always been pretty interested in what people think about it. And here's what I'd say is, while there is a stereotype to get back that older people have were convinced that, of course, and you would be, that reunification was kind of just around the corner or at least uh, it had to happen. Uh, whether it was through regime collapse or some kind of gradual process, it had to happen. 
after it, reunification did not happen in the 1970s following the end of the Cold War and the reunification of Germany, I think that you know, we've been through some waves of views among generations. And in the polling that I was going to mention, they talk about what they call the millennial generation. I think we all kind of know what the millennial generation is. And we call, in my generation calls them our children. Um, and uh, they also call, uh, in, in, in South Korea, they have something they call the IMF generation. And that's the generation whose, I guess, worldview was kind of forged by the uh, Asian financial crisis uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the late 90s. Um, and what you certainly do see, I actually, I'm going to tell you just two polls. I'm gonna, one was conducted by Seoul National University, and the other was conducted by the uh, Korean Institute of National U Unification. So this is a kind of a quasi-government institute that's goal is unification. And, um, you know, they, 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 and they ask Koreans this all the time. They ask the question of, do you think that reunification is, of course, it's reunification, right? It's not, a, uh, Korea was for a long time a unified state. Um, is it necessary? It's kind of an interesting word. Is it necessary? And uh, the Seoul National University poll showed that uh, this, this is just this month or last month, October, that, um, the lowest percentage since the survey ever began in 2007 said that uh, reunification with North Korea is necessary. It was only 44%. Um, I, I have to add though, that the other poll I mentioned, the one from the Korean Institute of National Unification said, actually it's 58%, it's up from 52% in 2020. So that's just a sign to say, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna quote a lot of other figures because um, you can find something to support a lot of cases. But I think one thing that is clear, and this is shown in, in both these polls, and I won't cite all the numbers, is that there is a clear generational gap. Uh, and uh, uh, the younger generation, I think, tends to be a bit more pr pragmatic. And younger, well, at my age means anybody under the age, I guess is the IMF generation, certainly millennial generation, but under the age of about 40, um, is looking at the economic costs of, un of unification on, on the one hand. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, they do, and, and this has been a strong showing, they do continue to, to, to feel strongly. And this is reinforced by the Pyeongchang Olympics, by this uh, period of rapprochement that we did have briefly over 2018-19 between North and South, that Koreans are one people. Uh, there's a lot more interest in, I think, and more sympathy for the the struggles that, that North Korean defectors have uh, in South Korean society and much more numerous over the last 10 or 20 years than ever before since the division. So all those things have affected attitudes about, about uh, uh, what the future should be. But another thing that comes out in the polls is that people want this to be peaceful and they would certainly be ready to settle for, and I think this goes across generations, settle for if not complete reunification, um, something that was uh, uh, described in one poll is if North Korea opens the borders to each other and cooperates on political and economic matters, that could be considered a unification even if the two Koreans are not one country. So th something coming co closer to something that I think President Moon Jae-in and other previous presidents have tried to uh, suggest, particularly on the progressive side, is, is a more reasonable uh, alternative, a more peaceful alternative, a gradual, uh, a gradual state of, of rapprochement uh, to reunification. Now, the question in all this, and I'll stop here in a minute, is, you know, how would North Korea feel about, could North Korea survive a kind of soft reunification, if you like? Could it survive the, the example of South Korea there, but not be reunified? But that's one of many questions I imagine we might explore. Uh, but my, 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 my point, just to tie a bow on, on these initial comments, is, is to say, uh, you know, we, I, I think Negotiators, whether they're in Washington or, or Seoul or you know wherever they are in the uh, or Pyongyang, you know we, we can't forget about the fact that this is indeed the Korean Peninsula, that a peace process, a peace regime is necessary along with it, if you whether you call it denuclearization or arms control, uh, those things need to go uh, if not in parallel, they all have to be part of the picture of what we're trying to solve. That was great. Uh... Let me turn to, uh, to Sasha and uh, get your thoughts. I mean, as political scientists, you've gone through a lot of, uh, you've sifted through a lot of polling data. I guess one question I have about some of this Korean polling data is you see this evident, um, I won't say split, but you know, young people tend to look at things differently. But are the numbers kind of volatile in, in your experience? I mean, is one year they're kind of feeling uh, more of a sense of unification the next year. They're thinking, wow, we don't want any part of this. Hey, Chris, uh, first of all, 
Thank you so much uh, for hosting this panel. This is another amazing opportunity for us to get together and brainstorm uh, really critical issues uh, on the peninsula. I am glad to welcome uh, Ambassador Stevens uh, as our very distinguished guest. Uh, now, you hit the nail on the head here. Uh, I'd say volatility uh, is really uh, the, you know, the name of the game because depending on the geopolitical circumstances, depending on the domestic political uh, dynamics in the South, uh, you know, the population uh, in the Republic of Korea uh, tends to have uh, uh, different uh, sentiments towards uh, uh, the unification. One day they like it, they want it. Uh, now, uh, the next day, uh, you know, they hate it uh, and they try to uh, not even think about it because they see the bill, they have the cost of unification, uh, and they, they, you know, they're too burdened uh, with their own problems even to think about it. Uh, so the general sentiment could be that they're not interested and, uh, you know, they don't really care that much. Now, uh, and that's, uh, that, that's very important to keep in mind. Uh, now, we, we saw that major push uh, by the pre previous administration, uh, President Park's administration. Uh, she talked about unification all the time. She actually made an effort, very strong effort to expedite it, you know, whether it was done to galvanize, you know, the public support for the domestic uh, politics or uh, out of genuine concern for that, uh, what she called the reign of terror in the North and to anticipation of the imminent collapse there. And she wanted the country, uh, your country to be prepared uh, for that. Uh, it's another matter. And then it kind of everything died down. Uh, and now three years later, four years later, uh, we are back, uh, you know, seeing uh, some renewed interest, uh, at least uh, in some quarters of the Moon administration uh, to jumpstart the discussions on this issue. Uh, under the slogan of the end of the war declaration. Now, I would like to uh, uh, kind of pivot a little bit uh, because unification, you know, it takes two to tango. And, uh, uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, Ambassador Stevens talked about this uh, uh, bifurcation, growing bifurcation of uh, uh, sentiments uh, in the South, you know, much less interest uh, among the millennials uh, and uh, kind of staying power of pro unification sentiment uh, among the older generation. You turn, uh, you pivot to the North and you look what's going on there. And we, uh, I would say, see a very interesting picture. Uh, you know, the North Korean leadership the Kim family, for whom it's been uh, basically their family business, uh, you know, the unification line, the United Front strategy, uh, you, you know, the uh, campaign to transform the entire Korean Peninsula uh, into, uh, you know, a country like North Korea, you know, where North Korea is the best Korea. Uh, now, we see some early signs of the uh, third generation uh, leadership uh, beginning to walk away uh, from the unification ideals and the unification concept. And whether it's tactical, uh, trying to basically position themselves for better nego negotiations uh, with the South, or whether it's strategic, it's not clear yet. Uh, but when you think about, uh, you know, the North Korean uh, a decision to blow up the joint liaison uh, office in Kherson, or their uh, threat to uh, shut down uh, the United Front Department uh, because, you know, they are no longer interested in exporting the revolution uh, across the border, or the threat to disband the Committee for Peaceful Reunification of the Fatherland, which is a uh, an analog of the Ministry of Unification, signaling that, you know, basically, uh, they are uh, no longer interested in unification. Now that uh, raises some questions about where the leadership stands on this issue. And of course, when you read some of Kim Jong-un's statements, recent statements uh, about uh, 
uh, the uh, you know essentially uh, criticizing uh, his own young people uh, for uh, showing not enough appreciation for the North Korean uh, uh, culture, you know, North Korean elements of uh, national identity, uh, showing some lack of patriotism, you know, him uh, essentially criticizing uh, his peers, you know, the youth uh, for the uh, increasing interest in uh, K-pop, Korean culture. Uh, you would wonder, you know, uh, what, what's really going on there and whether uh, maybe, you know, that uh, uh, emerging shift away uh, from uh, the uh, kind of single-minded pursuit of the unification dream uh, for whatever reason, uh, maybe uh, that, that's uh, uh, something which is not only characteristic of the South, but also of the North as well. And two careers... Uh, which existed long enough as uh, independent states, you know, with very different uh, economic systems, uh, you know, very different political systems, uh, the language uh, differences uh, growing, of course. Uh, as you recall, uh, Kim De Jun, after his meeting, after his summit with uh, uh, Kim, uh, uh, Kim Jong Un, uh, Kim Jong Il. Uh, he uh, once said that he could understand only 80% of what uh, Kim Jong-il was uh, saying to him because of the linguistic differences. Uh, so maybe all these, uh, you know, maybe history matters. And the fact that for 70 years, these two countries uh, had independent existence, uh, you know, economy-wise, socially, politically, culturally, uh, maybe the chickens are beginning to come uh, home to roost, so to speak. And the unification, uh, although rhetorically, yes, it's still present. And uh, the two, uh, uh, you know, the leaderships of the two countries can't really uh, walk away uh, from the unification rhetoric, unification discourse, uh, the politics of unification. Uh, but fundamentally, they're moving in different directions and maybe... Uh, you know, it's not as inevitable or necessary uh, as uh, we are conditioned to expect. Yeah. Kathy, if I can turn back to the question, in, in, in the ROK, it used to be you're defined as Korean, that is on the peninsula, and of course, therefore, imbibed with the issue of, you know, what are the political arrangements on the peninsula? Shouldn't Koreans be together? But as you pointed out, you've got Koreans now who I think see themselves, I won't say as global citizens, but as people who are making a contribution globally, you know, K-pop obviously, but so many other things as well. And in so doing, this definition takes away the, this concept of, of global identity, takes away the identity as Korean on the Korean Peninsula, uh, considering what the future uh, future political arrangements are. And then you combine that with what uh, Sasha's point that, you know, 70 years is a long time. Uh, you know, maybe it's a, um, it's a train that's left the station and Koreans are okay or just going to be thinking about what their role is in the world. And unless there's some crisis on the Korean Peninsula, a crisis that would open again this question of future political arrangements, uh, you know, the ROK Koreans may have just kind of uh, moved on. Is that a possibility? That is, it's not as up and down and volatile. It might actually be in one kind of direction. Yeah, I, yeah I'm not sure. I mean, I'm really interested in what Sasha had to say about trends in the North. I think that is very significant. And, yeah. and, and Chris, with respect to the South, I was thinking about the fact that, yeah, I, I think you make a really good point that there is a Korean identity that is not totally dependent on what passport you carry. And there's yeah. a Korean pride that in a way transcends a, a, the more traditional nationalism. That said, I do think that nationalism remains a very powerful force. And since there is polling that actually indicates that, that over the past several years, South Koreans, including young South Koreans, are more likely to say that we from the North and the South, we're the same people. 
And I think one reason for that actually is that uh, although now it's you know a little forgotten with all that happened afterwards with the collapse of the Kim Jong Un you know Trump uh, bromance and summit diplomacy, but um, but you know when uh, and I'm sure uh, Chris and Sasha will both remember this when. Um, uh, when, when, in addition to the meetings that President Trump had with Kim Jong Un, of course, Moon Jae-in had meetings uh, with um, with Kim Jong Un, and I remember how many Koreans said to me that they were just like just astonished. I mean, it was a, uh, and these are young, young Koreans of all ages, but I think especially younger ones when they saw Kim Jong Un and his party speaking speaking to each other, the two leaders of the two Koreas in a language without an interpreter. Yeah, it doesn't happen for Korean leaders from North or South, right? They were talking, and okay, maybe maybe they you know didn't understand. You know, maybe there's dialect differences in development and so on. But what I recall from that is that at least for that moment, and maybe it's volatile, but at least for that period, there was a reminder that we speak the same language and we 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 do share something that Koreans don't share with anybody else, right? And I, I think that's very powerful. Um, Kathleen, uh, let me ask you a question. What exactly do they share? Because when Chris said, I mean, South Koreans are turning global. I mean, really, we're talking about global Korea with its culture, with its economy, whatever. These characteristics, uh, they're not really shared by the North Koreans. They're not global. They're isolated. They're really like uh, Umurana Keburi, that frog sitting at the bottom of the well looking at the top of the well, see, seeing that little bit of sky, thinking that that's their world. So when I ask, uh, you know, my counterparts, usually what's Koreanness in Korea, you know? And uh, is it kimchi? Is it the tiger? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Is it uh, uh, the mountain spirit? Is it the language? Is it the K-pop? But then what's North Korean and that Koreanness and what's South Korean and that Koreanness, which is clearly different? Uh, the reason why I'm asking this question is because, uh, you know, I'm uh, uh, culturally, I, I come from a country which no longer exists. Uh, that's a weird, uh, you know, place to be. Uh, and the current leader of uh, the successor country keeps saying that the Russian and Ukrainian people are the same people, you know, and he cites uh, centuries of history, closely integrated economy and blah, blah, blah. And the fact that, by the way, they were separated only for 20 years and they speak the same language, more or less. Uh, and yet, you know, most of the Russians, most of the Ukrainians, they don't see it that way. They don't want to be part of a, the new uh, amalgamated state anymore. Uh, I, I, you know, the same about Russian Belarusia, but they give it a different take. Uh, again, despite centuries of common history, a closely integrated economic complex, you know, joint military culture, everything was there, but now it's all different, despite the language. So the fact that you know, they speak the same language. Uh, and, you know, Putin and Zelensky, Putin and Lukashenko, they speak for hours the same language. It doesn't, you know, make them any closer uh, to uh, the reunification bit. Um, and so well, what is it that uh, North Koreanness, for example, or South Koreanness, which makes it so different uh, in the minds of some, but pretty much the same in the minds of others, uh, and leads to the unification, the necess necessity of unification, which, in my opinion, is not really a necessity. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a choice uh, which uh, leaders, under certain circumstances, may make. They will sell it to the public, uh, will bring it along eventually uh, to justify the choice. But, uh, you know, the constituency for that choice in the South is shrinking. Uh, and in the North, again, I, I don't even believe that the constituency for that choice, political choice of unification is there at all. Because uh, what's the North Korean elite? I mean, it's a common argument. What do they have to gain from the unification? They will be wiped out. I mean, uh, the Korean Workers' Party, the Korean People's Army, uh, you know, the, all the members of North Korean elite today, what, two, three, four million people, they will lose everything. They stand to lose everything in the, any unification scheme. Uh, and as long as they hold the levers of power, you know, 
thank you, but we are not interested, they would, uh, they would tell us. And we, because we isolated this country, because we don't engage it, we don't do what we did in uh, Ronald Reagan times, you know, when we opened up the Soviet Union full press, you know, engaged it all across the board, and basically used our soft power and investment uh, to uh, penetrate that country, basically turn it upside down, flip it around, and you know, made sure that it changed with the North. You know, we, we are not doing it. You know, we just sanctioned it all the way as much as we can for the reasons having nothing to do with unification, of course, because we don't like what they're doing and, uh, you know, nuclear, human rights, whatever. I mean, the Soviet Union was no better. The Soviet Union also had a nuclear arsenal. It also had a horrible human rights record. And still, it didn't stop us from uh, engaging them, trading with them, uh, you know, applying soft power across the board, nurturing the elements uh, of new elites there, which eventually made the trick for us and made sure that the Soviet Union is uh, no longer in existence. Yeah. Well, you know, I, as I listen to you, I think, you know, probably uh, I... Just as, as your your background as a, a Russian and, and thinking of Russia and Ukraine and, and the drama of the last uh, uh, decades there, I'm probably influenced by not only my experience in Korea, of course, but uh, but by my time in places like Northern Ireland and the Balkans. But that's another story in terms of the stickiness sometimes of senses of national identity and what is the proper arrangement of things. But, you know, with respect to Korea, um, yeah, you know, I, I do think I, it, that there is a, 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 you can say this about anywhere, I suppose, but there's a very, still a very deep sense of Korean identity. And yes, the language is an important part of it. But, you know, going to, you know, the, the Japanese colonial period and before, you know, we can go back centuries here and say, what has, what has created the identity of Koreanness is a sense that this is a country that, against all odds, you know, the, uh, uh, the empire of China, uh, the absorptive power of that, whether it's hard or soft power of the Chinese, the Manchus, the Mongols, the Japanese, that, uh, that the Koreans have remained Korean. That, and, you know, that's, that's the national history slash mythology slash, and I think that's true in both North and South. Um, yeah, I say maybe this is my Peace Corps experience. I'm thinking of now of, of, of former Peace Corps volunteers like myself. I was not one of them who went to North Korea to work uh, uh, during the agreed framework period and when there was a period of substantial humanitarian assistance going into North Korea. And, you know, those of my generation who were there, so they were in, in South Korea in the 60s and the 70s and then in, in, in North Korea in the 90s. And they always said, we feel much more at home. These are, of course, non-Koreans. We feel much more, but speaking some Korean, we feel much more at home now in North Korea because it reminds us of South Korea in the 60s and the 70s. And they weren't talking just about levels of, of economic development or lack thereof, but the hunger for education, the hunger to, to, to be better, to, to uh, get their families to, you can say these are universal drives, but as we, we all know, they're pretty strong in Korea. And to me, they do define something that's very Korean. Does that mean that they're inevitably going to reunify into one political state? I agree with you. One, that's a choice. Two, it has to be a choice that, I don't want to sound like a former American diplomat, but that the Korean people make uh, through democratic means. Um, but there has to be some kind of, I believe, or it, reconciliation. And it, I think that the, the United States and the international community have a certain obligation as we think about the challenges of North Korea to also pay attention to that issue of, of reconciliation. What um, certainly the polling and my own, and as, as, as you've affirmed, uh, my own sense of, of among the South Koreans I know is that you know, if there could be peaceful coexistence, I think Chris got in trouble for using the word peaceful coexistence once a long time ago in 2005, but he writes about that in his book. But anyway, uh, <laughs> sounded too Soviet. But, um, but if there could be a peaceful coexistence between North and South Korea, and that's again what the polling is showing, that allowed uh, uh, some, some humanitarian you know, reunification, again, of millions and millions of families, and granted, you know, most of those who had, who had direct relatives they actually knew have now passed on. But these are still powerful ties that are going to play a political role in South Korea, indeed in the United States. 
where we have a large Korean American community, and also I think in some ways in, in, in North Korea. But to me, I mean, in addition to you know the challenges where we, we you're spending this series talking about of North Korea taking this direction, which is putting it to odds not just with South Korea but with the whole international community with respect to its nuclear program. The other question for me is to what extent you've alluded to what extent is South Korea really you know more of an existential threat to North Korea than the United States is because it does present another model of what it means to be Korean. And as Kim Jong-un has alluded to, that's rather threatening to the North. You know, can Absolutely. this be more and, sometime? And what? that's precisely the reason why Kim Jong-un appears to be moving closer to saying that we're no longer interested in unification. We want to be, you know, the North Korea is the best Korea. We want to stand alone around on our okay, own feet. We right. want to be left alone. But, but, it, no, my, but, uh, but I'm asking you, can, can Kim Jong-un accept a better relationship with South Korea? Or does a better relationship with South Korea know, allow, you know, make it too porous? You know, make it make, make South Korea too much of, a, of the alternative view of what North Korea could be like? Oh, absolutely. I, I think, uh, you know, the policy towards the South, uh, which uh, he has in mind, is changing in the sense that uh, you know, he does want to have a better relationship uh, so that on the one hand, whatever government they have in the South would recognize the legitimacy of the North Korean rule. A, B, uh, would uh, basically be uh, plugged in into the North Korean decision-making cycle, especially in the economic terms, so that two economies get increasingly, quote-unquote, harmonized in the sense that he can basically tap into the South Korean resources for his own uh, social economic development and see uh, the uh, he could acquire leverage in the South so that he can use South Korea as in a way as a shield uh, or as a lever in his relationships uh, with other countries, especially the United States uh, and Japan, but also uh, China as well occasionally. So. In that sense, that's how he sees that growing, extending integration between the two countries, that pan-Korean integration. When he gets all the benefits without uh, paying much of the cost, when uh, leaders in Seoul can basically serve at his beck and call uh, to satisfy you know, his own domestic, economic, and political uh, needs. Uh, but my question uh, to you would be, uh, you know, if he says he is not interested in unification one way or another, then where does it leave the South uh, with its own unification interests and rhetoric? Because in a way, if you turn the tables, all of a sudden, uh, South Korean unification strategy could be characterized as a land grab, as a pursuit of an uh, annexation of a country which is not willing to be annexed. It's like, you know, the Ukrainians or Belarusians telling the Russians, thank you, but we're not interested, you know, in seeing your empire to be rebuilt at our expense. So that's what worries me. If Kim Jong-un walks away from the fig leaf of unification rhetoric, because I think at this point, you know, uh, he is really, he doesn't want to export revolution to the South or gobble up the South. I mean, he is realistic. He understands he can do it. Uh, but if he abandons even the rhetoric of unification, not the uh, realistic drive, then it might leave the South exposed to the accusations uh, that, you know, it's pursuing, uh, quote unquote, an imperialist policy aimed at the land grab uh, across the border. Uh, yes, justified by, you know, centuries, uh, old common history, you know, shared language, uh, shared uh, cultural traditions, etc. But nevertheless, you know, when uh, the object of your desire uh, does not share, you know, your desire, then it leaves you in a pretty bad uh, position. Wouldn't you agree? Kathy, if I could just ask uh, also, uh, one of the ongoing discussions right now, of course, is this issue of some kind of end of war uh, declaration. Uh, this has been a sort of hardy perennial 
in Korea negotiations, the feeling that, gee, if only we would end the war, then North Korea would feel that we don't have a hostile policy. But I think, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's some other factors here that run a lot deeper than simply the question of uh, addressing North Korea's uh, uh, supposed concerns about a ho hostile policy. And I guess my question to you is when, when South Koreans talk about end of war, first of all, is this shared across demographic uh, uh, lines? Uh, secondly, is this kind of speaking to the deeper concept of Korea as victim, a terrible victim really in the 20th century, and that this is somehow to allow Korea to get out from under this sense of uh, victimhood at the hands of great powers? Yeah, these are all very deep questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I mean, maybe go to Sasha's because I think it leads into, uh, first of all, to say, I, I mean, with respect to if, if, if North Korea, if Kim Jong un really has uh, kind of given up on, on the notion that the North can reunify the South and, and be the, and, and, and the Kim dynasty has all of Korea, um, one, I just, there's a lot of South Koreans, you know, we keep talking about South Koreans, I, and I do, is that the polling, they think this, they think that. I mean, as you both well know, there are a lot of uh, South Koreans who are convinced that Kim Jong-un has not given up on this and that he's, you know, he's seducing the government of, of Moon Jae-in. And that gets to some of the worry about the end of war declaration, if you like. You're going to play into, you know, this, this the grand strategy that has not gone away of the reunification by subversion, force, pressure, you know, nuclear weapons, uh, not using them, the, the threat of them, that the North still could overcome as, as unlikely as that seems. So I'm very interested in Sasha's, Sasha's point on that. And I think that if it's, if truly Kim Jong-un is trying to signal that he's, he's not going to pursue reunification the same way that has been very much part of the DPRK's, you know, raison d'etre, if you like, mm -hmm. um, I, I think any, any South Korean government is going to try to, to, take a gradual approach, because again, that would be their preferred path, that they don't take on the burden, if you like, of North Korea and the instability and the cost and all of the, that, 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 that comes and that, uh, that, that comes with that. That's a very unpopular choice, but rather tries to have a very gradual uh, uh, and normalization uh, and warming of the relationship. And of course, this was the idea behind the projects now long shuttered of, but still talked about uh, like uh, the Kaesong Industrial Park and tourism and so on and so forth. So that takes us to another thing long talked about, right? Of this, this end of war declaration and right, Chris, and I mean, you know, cause you were so involved in this as well. I mean, this has been around for a long time. And I mean, understandably we have an armistice that was signed in 1953 and it said within a period of time which is thought to be a matter of months uh, there should be a permanent peace settlement. So you have kind of this, again, this kind of historical anomaly, if you like, of, uh, of, of still being an armistice. But in fact, it's an armistice that is certainly not perfect, but it has helped to maintain an uneasy but very important uh, uh, peace uh, on the Korean Peninsula uh, over the last 70 years. So I think the, the, you know, the issue about the, the end of war declaration now, I mean, I think the kind of standard wisdom, and I guess is that, you know, Moon Jae-in's come to the end of his term. Uh, clearly the high hopes of 2018 and 2019 have, have, have been much, <laughs> have, have not been realized, um, but he'd like to have a bit of a legacy and a legacy would say, see, we've, we've pushed the ball down the road a little bit. We have an end of war declaration and this is going to get the North Koreans to the table and or build some confidence to get them to the table and get something going. So, you know, the sentiment is, is, is understandable. I, I think the challenge is, is there's worry that I, and I guess that the, an end of war statement or, or can either be too little, you know, or too much. If it's too little, um, it means that basically, because it's about the US and South Korea are doing what we have done many times before and said, we don't have a hostile policy towards, uh, towards the DPRK. We are ready to negotiate. We are not going to attack. There have been various iterations. You know, we consider the conflict over. You know, there's been various, various words used. They've never quite been enough. 
uh, to take North Korea off its, and you know, trust is hard to build, it's true, but to take it off of its point that, you know, you have a hostile policy and besides you could change any moment. So I think if there's a statement of, of an end of war, there's a, there's a great risk that North Korea will just kind of pocket it, but nothing will really happen. And that's, we move on. The other worry though, is that it's too much. And that if we get sucked into this, that we're going to to then North Korea is then going to present either you know before, during, and after a series of other demands. The war is over. Therefore, you don't need to have uh, military uh, exercises. You don't need to have troops on the peninsula. Uh, san- sanctions need to be lifted. You know, if that got us into a negotiation, that's where we want to get. But but you know that you don't want to make these. You can't really end the war until you have or have a peace treaty. These are a peace agreement until you actually build some confidence on the ground. Now in 2018, Moon Jae-in and Kim Jong-un had a military agreement. It was quite good in many ways. It wasn't about nuclear weapons, it was about other things like you know all, all the other conventional forces, not all of them, but along the DMZ and so on. Can there be confidence building measures? So it, I, you know, that's, that's if the end, uh, this end of war statement they're talking about cannot do all that. That's a process. It's going to take a lot of negotiations and it's going to take actions on the ground to get to a point where you can say, um, you know, we, we actually do have something that's going to begin to, to, to improve upon the, the, the armistice situation we're in. But that cannot be just a statement that you sign absent any, any action on the ground. That, that would be how I would view it. Chris, I don't know what your thoughts are on this. Yeah, I think... Uh... It, it really is something that's come to the forefront because after a great deal of time where the North Koreans didn't address it, suddenly this seems to be on the center of their agenda. Uh, I think there is a lot of concern that it just is something they, you know, they're interested until they're not. And this happens a lot uh, with, their, uh, with their various initiatives and or they're interested because they don't think the other side is interested. So I'm not sure it really addresses much. Uh, but I do feel there's a growing anxiety in the ROK about uh, some of the economic problems in North Korea that will lead, that could lead to uh, mass starvation and issues of that kind. And there's where I think there is a certain pan-Koreanism where I don't think Koreans in the ROK want to stand by and watch North Koreans starve if some of these reports are true. Now, it's hard to predict harvests when, you know, I mean, they haven't gotten, uh, you know, we just don't know what the harvest is going to look like. But, uh, but I think certainly there's a concern that they can't stand by and watch this uh, and watch some calamity uh, unfold. So I think there's a, gotta, there's a kind of attitude, don't just stand there, do something. Chris, uh, could I make a comment on the end of war declaration? I, I see it as a tactical ploy uh, for the Moon administration, uh, basically to get the North Koreans re-engaged back to the negotiation table, uh, despite the principle, one of the principles which all US administrations uh, try to push in our dealings with the North, and that is uh, we do not uh, offer the North Korean side payments just for the return to the negotiations. Of course, in reality, we do, but at least as a matter of principle, you know, we would like to uh, say that. And this is the latest example of that when, you know, the Biden administration after developing, putting together that new approach, you know, everybody waited for it for a long time. Once they made it public, all of a sudden, you know, they realize that North Koreans are not interested. And for the past several months, uh, they've been uh, trying very hard to uh, get the North Koreans uh, to pay attention to what they're saying and come back to the table uh, before the clock runs out uh, on the, the Moon administration. I mean, uh, we don't really know whether the North Koreans uh, are interested in this end of war declaration or not. I suspect that they are not. It's a piece of paper, very symbolic in the opinion, which does not resolve any of their problems, whether it's the security problem or economic problem or uh, whatever problem. Uh, And uh, at least the way uh, it's talked about now, uh, I, you know, Japan and the former Soviet Union signed a peace declaration, you know, the end of war declaration in 1956, It led to the establishment of diplomatic relations after the war, normalization of relations, but it didn't really solve, uh, you know, the territorial dispute 
or uh, you know many other problems which existed at that time, and still you know the peace treaty between those two countries uh, is nowhere to be seen. They've been talking about it for 60 years. So for some uh, critics of the end of war declaration on the Korean Peninsula who uh, fear the slippery, you know, the advocates of the slippery slope argument, you know, once we put this horse, of, uh, you know, ahead of the cart uh, and uh, uh, sign it uh, now, then it will, you know, all hell will break loose. You know, the North Koreans will demand the pull out of the U.S. troops, the dissolution of the alliance and all that. I would say, I, I don't understand their fears. Uh, you know, North Koreans always said it before, they will always say it in the future, as long as we're in Korea, uh, regardless of whether, you know, there is a piece of paper called the peace treaty or, you know, the end of war declaration or not. I mean, we, uh, we, we have peace, uh, you know, with the Soviet Union back in the 70s, the Helsinki Act, uh, which certified the borders in Europe at that time, uh, but it didn't mean that we stopped exercising, you know, we unified Germany. It didn't mean that we pulled out our troops from Germany, uh, despite what the critics, uh, you know, often said. So uh, these concerns that all of a sudden, you know, the North Korean case would be uh, strengthened if, uh, you know, we sign a peace treaty and uh, remove the rationale for the existence of our troops in Korea, uh, you know, there are so many reasons why our troops uh, are deployed in Korea. There are so many reasons why, you know, the U.S. Rock Alliance is uh, important, not just for the security of our two countries, but uh, regional security and global security, I would say, that it's beyond, you know, the end of war declaration or the peace treaty logic here. And I'm, uh, I don't understand why uh, we fear so much, you know, the backlash from the North or the cunning ploy to exploit uh, you know, this uh, symbolic piece of paper, uh, you know, for uh, the reasons uh, which, you know, were mentioned before. Yeah. I don't think um, it's so much, I don't think it's so much fear as it is more exasperation. Uh, you know, now they want an end of war declaration. Fine. Where's that really going to lead? And it's a sense but they don't want it. I mean, the North Koreans don't want it. I don't they, know. You know they can take it as a freebie, but, you know, that's not what they're interested in. They, they want sanctions relief. Really. I mean, yeah. they don't even need the humanitarian assistance. They're telling us, if you're really worried about our economic situation, then leave the sanctions so that we can sell coal to China. We can sell electricity to China. We can buy fuel from China. You know, we can start trading again. Then our economic situation will improve. We don't need this, uh, you know, uh, handouts from you or freebie, meaningless freebies from you. We just want to be normal. We want to be treated as normal. And by the way, you say, oh, you test nukes, you test missiles. That's why you're abnormal and we sanction you. But the South Koreans are doing the same. They're now accusing us of double standards because South Koreans launched a nuclear submarine. India tested nuclear weapons. So they say South Korea is shooting rockets into space. Why are we treated as different? You know, that's their logic. And so they say, if you're really brethren here, you know, and really, if you really feel compassion towards us, I mean, then start at, at the very least treating us as a normal state, not as an exceptional, uh, you know, state. And by the way, our human rights record, look at your best buddy in Saudi Arabia. I mean, then how he chops up people, you know, whom he doesn't like. And that doesn't even come close, you know, to what we do to our opponents. I mean, you know the logic. I mean, you know the arguments. Well, that, so, that, yeah, let me throw back to Kennedy then on, on that point. I mean, uh, the North Koreans say, you know, give us sanctions relief. We'll be better. We won't uh, need your uh, humanitarian assistance. I don't get any sense that South Koreans are buying it. And if anything, I think polling data suggest that the South Koreans are, are a little tired of this act. Is that kind of what we're seeing now? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's right. I mean, and, and again, on this end of war declaration, I, I mean, I'm really not sure how much, I think it probably breaks down a little bit on partisan lines, again, as we go into an election in South Korea and, and the, uh, the Conservative Party now, to, now out of power will nominate its candidate, uh, I think later on this week. Uh, 
But um, and I don't expect actually North Korea to be the issue, I, although, you know, things could happen between now and then. What's the saying that elections are decided by things that haven't happened yet? But right now, the uh, the agenda for the election is very much about about the economy and post pandemic and a lot of other things, China. But um, but but no, I mean, just to kind of wrap up on that, that the, the end of war thing, I, I think I agree with Sasha and I, that, that I, I'm not too worried about the slippery slope argument that, you know, people make that. And, there's, and I think there's some worry in South Korea. You hear a lot of it in Washington about that. I'm not so worried about that. I, I also agree that it doesn't seem like North Korea has been so interested, but to say they aren't until they are and vice versa. But I and, and I guess if I were um, Chris, I mean, you know, thinking of our, our, our former colleague, Sung Kim, you know, thinking about managing the, 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 the work together with Seoul on what the approach to North Korea is, you know, if, uh, if, if, if Seoul feels strongly that, you know, we, we, we should reiterate another, again, that we don't have a hostile policy, that we're ready to talk. I mean, I think Ambassador Kim has done that um, and can continue to repeat that and hope that, that begins to provide some confidence and we want to sit down, you know, you just have to keep right. A lot of diplomacy of life is just repeating yourself but maybe finding different words to do it in. Then, you know, if the South Koreans want to call that an end of war declaration, I guess they will, <laughs> not to be too cynical about it. But, you know, I, I think there's, there's room for trying to reassure that we'd have to be clear about what it is and what it isn't. Okay, Sasha, any comments on that from the North <laughs> point of view? I just don't understand oh. what the North policy is right now. I really am a little puzzled by it. Uh, you know, they kind of lurch from one issue uh, to the other. They say they have this great interest in economy. I don't see any diminution in their interest in, in various weapons. And I know the argument, well, India has nuclear weapons, therefore we should have uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, Kim Gaewon gave me that argument way back in, uh, in 05, and I listened, and then I said, you know, there's just not enough time in the day to explain to you the difference between India and your country, so let's move on, okay? Uh, so I, I just I, I just don't have a sense that they're playing for time, not playing for time. I just don't have a sense that they have a real clear understanding of what they're doing apart from surviving from one day to the next. Yeah, Chris, uh, I, I know we, we have only a couple of minutes left, so uh, I, I'd like to ask Ambassador uh, Stevens the big question. I mean, we started with the, uh, your uh, evaluation of the attitudes of young people in South Korea towards unification. And uh, uh, I, I have a very, uh, I got a rather pessimistic uh, kind of impression of where, uh, you know, the millennials in South Korea are headed for. So the big question uh, for you, Ambassador, is really simple. Do you think you will see Korea united in your lifetime? Yes or no? It's just a yes or no answer. Will Korea be unified in your lifetime? All yours, Kathy. I know. Uh, I'm pretty old, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I don't. I don't think I can be. I. I. I have to tell one. I was born the year of the armistice. And so I'm reminded every day of how old the armistice is. Um, I only have to say, I hope that there will be a different relationship between North and South in my lifetime. Uh, I really hope there will be. Uh, I guess if I really was pressed, I, I do think it will be something, something approaching reunification, but you know, maybe in a different way, you know, but, but, uh, but some kind of different relationship. I just don't see, but you know, this. I hope that this the current state of affairs doesn't last forever. I mean, I want to get and and I'm actually going to pick that up, Sasha, and and, and and respond to Chris's kind of point or question a little bit about about you know where is North Korea and all this. I mean, one thing I, I maybe it's worth saying. I mean, Chris, you're talking about your conversation with Kim Gaguana and saying you know uh, you know North Korea, you're no India, you know. But with, with, as we say, all due respect, that was 15 years ago. And, you know, things have changed. That's what, this is much harder now in the sense that, you know, North Korea has, Kim Jong-un has, has, has built up this arsenal. I'm not saying it should be India, please don't misunderstand me, but it's built up this arsenal of nuclear weapons and these missiles. And I'm kind of thinking they're, they're feeling like they've kind of done it. Mm -hmm. um, in the meantime, though, as Chris, you point out, they are in a, a economic and possibly humanitarian crisis of unknown uh, proportions. 
uh, we just don't we just don't have much insight onto that. And so it's very, very, you know, <laughs> always hard, but impossible to really predict, you know, how this is going to play out. But I think sometimes when we go through our chronologies, we always do have agreed framework and six party talks and denuclearization. You know, we, we I mean, the, the, the joint statement of principles in 2005 was agreed before there had been a single nuclear test. You continue yeah. to make progress after there had been. But I think, you know, it's this, it, the passage of time has not been good for this. And we have to be very clear eyed about that. Not because the, the lesson, there aren't lessons from the past. There clearly are, and we have to build on what was done. But we're in a very, very different situation now, not only with respect, of course, to North Korea's uh, uh, nuclear st status and accomplishments, but you know, the relationship with China and a, a whole other order of things, which I know I'm sure we'll explore in the next hour. <laughs> Kathleen, I take it as a no. Uh, Chris, I would like to double down on it, and I don't expect to see Korean unified in my lifetime as well. Well, I was uh, I was born a, a year before the armistice, and uh, it's been a, a long time. I don't think North Korea goes on forever. I really don't. Uh, and I think there will be changes, but how they are or when they are is something that I think would be quite impossible to foretell. But I just don't see this situation going on forever. And I think that's why uh, we kind of meet every week to talk about this, because I just okay. don't think it's going to last forever. A lot of things last forever, but uh, I don't think this is one of them. Is the U.S. Rock Alliance the thing that will last forever? The U.S. Rock Alliance? Yeah, just well, does yeah. anything last forever? Well, when you look at what we talk about in that alliance today, compared to what we used to talk about, which was we used to talk about peninsula affairs day and night. Now we talk about all kinds of things. Um, I think it's a very good friendship. I really do. And I think it uh, makes a lot of sense for both countries. And it's not just tied to the, any crisis on the Korean Peninsula. So I think it's, um, you know, uh, I think in terms of its durability, it's very much there. And I think the U.S. has developed over time, thanks to people like Ambassador Stevens, is a much better understanding of how Korea works and a much better understanding that you don't, uh, you know, just tell Koreans what to do. They they have their own views and you want to consult and try to work with them. So I... I uh, I'm pretty optimistic about the alliance. Yeah. Nothing lasts forever, though. Even the Roman Empire it didn't. But I guess the US Rock Alliance has a better chance than the Roman Empire. So on, on that note, uh, Michael, let me uh, uh, turn back to you. Uh, and I think we've all kind of had the final word on you know, where this is going. But uh, the complexity of this issue really uh, um, is Quite Thank you so much, Ambassador Hill. Uh, this was an excellent session. Dr. Manzeroff, as always, uh, thank you for your, your comments and insights that cause us to go a little deeper. And Ambassador Stevens, we can't thank you enough for your participation today and your leadership. You and Ambassador Hill also played very key roles in strengthening the alliance between the ROK and the United States which I believe uh, is a very strong alliance. And we're uh, from the Washington Times Foundation, which is our sponsor. We wanna thank you all. Also, we wanna acknowledge the sponsorship of Universal Peace Federation and Think Tank 2022. We hope you've enjoyed this program. We'll be back on the first Tuesday of December. Uh, we have a very exciting program every month. And uh, we want to thank, again, Ambassador Hill for uh, being the moderator of this program and, and so thoughtfully leading us through uh, some challenging issues. Thank you to all of our viewers uh, in America and across the world. Thank you very much, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>